Welcome to an introduction to knowledge translation for the Fall 2013 offering of Nursing 3360. Knowledge translation is important to your practice. You might hear that, and you might also get confused by that. Hmm, knowledge, you know what that is, but translation, that kind of sounds like more work, and it might even sound like a different language. So I've got an idea. Let's look it up. Well, lucky you. I looked it up for you. So if I went to Google and Googled knowledge translation, what might I learn? Well, if I went to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research website, I would see this long and somewhat complicated definition. I'm going to try and say it in one breath. A dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve the health of Canadians, provide more effective health services and products, and strengthen the healthcare system. This process takes place. I didn't make it. That is a long, complicated definition, isn't it? What worries me a little more is that that's what you hear. Knowledge translation, I don't know what it is, but it sounds really complicated and really boring. And that would be too bad, because what I said to start this slideshow is really true. Knowledge translation is important to your practice. In particular, it's important because this is all about how we get new knowledge into practice. So what's this new knowledge and where does it come from? What about the knowledge gained in school as a nursing student? What about knowledge gained through experience and practice? Is this expertise an important form of knowledge for practice? What about the things our patients tell us in the clinical setting? Is that knowledge for practice? How does that fit when it might contradict the knowledge that I read in a journal? What about the practice expertise of colleagues? What about policies and procedures? Sure, of course, this is all knowledge that informs your practice. It makes sense, though, that we really want good, solid knowledge to inform our practice, right? I mean, just because we believe something and believe it strongly, it doesn't mean it's knowledge that we should use in practice. I might be superstitious and believe that shaking bones at the full moon will bring me good luck but it wouldn't be an appropriate nursing intervention, would it? If we want to be evidence-informed professionals, there are some rules around knowledge, wherever it comes from. Rules that act like a sieve to keep out the stuff that doesn't or shouldn't qualify as knowledge. Some of the toughest rules are around research. Research is defined as the systematic quest for knowledge. Research adds to new knowledge if the processes to do that research are judged as credible, and if the researcher has taken the step of getting his or her research out there for other researchers to critique. So research is an important source of new knowledge for practice, and a big part of what this course is all about. So we're going to spend a little more time focusing on the knowledge, the new knowledge that comes from research. So back to how we get all this good new knowledge into practice. This is a picture from your textbook in Chapter 20, and it's a picture that gives us a snapshot of how it's supposed to work. This is how new knowledge is supposed to find its way, or be translated, into practice. How come we do it this way? There's also some new knowledge in there that I might not be sure what it means. But first, I'd like you just to get the idea. So what are we really talking about here? Well. We know that there are curiosities and questions in practice, questions that we ask all the time. Why do we do things that way? Have we always done it that way? Is there a better way? And what does the evidence have to say about that? So when we're talking about knowledge translation, we're really talking about starting with staying and being curious in practice. Now for researchers, this means doing more research. I'm curious about a question, so I'm going to do some research to generate new knowledge so that we can learn more to answer that question. After new knowledge is gained through the course of research, it's important for that knowledge to be disseminated or shared. And really, that's all dissemination means, is sharing new knowledge or sharing research findings. 
Then there is the process of facilitating its appropriate and ethical use in practice, which would result, one would hope, in better care and in better care outcomes, about which we're going to continue to ask questions and stay curious. So you might be asking yourself, hey, I'm not a researcher, so what's this all got to do with me? Well, everything. As an evidence-informed professional, your patients are counting on your knowledge every day, and they are counting on you to know how to find the best evidence, know whether it's any good or not, and apply it appropriately and ethically in practice. So they are counting on you to be a smart and critical user of research. So what does that look like? Well, here's the cycle that you're already familiar with around knowledge translation with a few additions that you'll see here at the top. It's still very important to stay and be curious in practice. Again, why do we do it that way? Is there a better way? What does the evidence say? Then what does the practicing professional do? They seek, they, they, first of all, they stay curious and then they seek answers in the published research evidence by finding and reading current research. Then it's very important to be able to answer the question, is this research credible? Can I trust the answers that I find there? And then another series of questions that are all about assessing its fit for your population. So does this research fit? And is this just one study or is there a body of evidence that exists to answer my question? If there is substantial, credible evidence that is synthesized to answer my question, then it's time to take this active discussion to the practice setting for further discussion of the implications of this new evidence for our population in our setting. Sometimes the answer is, this isn't a fit, at least not yet, but let's stay on top of the current evidence as it evolves. Or, yes, this is a really important piece of evidence for our setting. Let's make sure that we get it into policy in order to ultimately benefit our patients. So this process of going to the research to intelligently inform practice is called research utilization. Think of research utilization as part of evidence-informed practice, a really big part. Research utilization is about taking up sound, good, solid evidence into practice. We see this in our policies and in many of the activities that we undertake in the practice environment. So research utilization is part of being an evidence-informed practitioner. Okay, so knowledge translation is really just about how we go about getting new knowledge into practice in order to improve care. And now you know that a very important source of new knowledge is research. So if you are a nurse who is also a researcher, you can actually carry out research studies to answer your perplexing clinical questions. But when you are a nurse who is not a researcher, you still have burning clinical questions. But you answer them instead by finding, reading, and understanding research, and then knowing how to decide if the research is credible or not. This is research utilization, and it's a big part of evidence-informed practice. Okay, well, none of that sounds too hard. What could possibly go wrong? Well, unfortunately, a lot goes wrong. In too many cases, we don't do what we know. An awful lot of knowledge is lost in translation. Studies from the United States and from the Netherlands, in fact, suggest that 30 to 40 percent of patients do not receive care that complies with current research evidence. Yikes! Just as an example, there's been some research that certainly demonstrates just having the knowledge is not enough. In the 80s, there was research done that demonstrated that the best position for laying newborn infants on in order to sleep, the best position was on their back. In 2004, a research team headed by Statsny published, they published an article in the 2004 edition, uh, volume 53 of Nursing Research, that looked at how nurses use that new knowledge about laying babies on their back. How do they use that in practice? 
They identified that 72% of nurses in their study recognized the back or supine position for newborns as the optimal sleep position. But when they ac actually asked nurses how many of them placed babies on their back, the response was a dismal 33%. So the nurses knew the research, they knew the evidence, but they didn't actually apply that knowledge in practice. So our process that looks very tidy and very simple must have an awful lot of devils in those details. It makes one want to ask. What's the problem? Did I have you there for a minute? What is the problem? Why don't we do what we know? And it's a big problem with big consequences. Failure to use the best health care research is costly and harmful. It may lead to the overuse of ineffective care or the underuse of effective care. And it may introduce poten potential errors and risk to patient care. Put yourself or someone you love on the receiving end of care. Wouldn't you expect your health care providers to use the best evidence to inform that care? Of course, we all would. So something has to be getting in the way. Think about your past experiences in the healthcare environment. What might you expect would be some barriers to getting new knowledge into practice? There's been research done on this with nurses to find out what is getting in the way. What we find from research, and you will know this, is that we are in a high velocity care environment and there are a lot of things that prevent us from following the best evidence in our practice. Research shows this. A very common response in research studies on this problem is lack of time. In other words, who's got time to read new research? There's also sometimes resistance to change. How often have you heard, we've always done it that way? Well, maybe there's good reason, maybe there's not. And resistance to change can be a barrier. There may be a lack of interest in new research or a lack of awareness that it even exists. There may be a lack of knowledge and skill in how to access, understand, and critique new research, even how to consider applying it in practice. There may be a lack of resources or a lack of ability to access new research and evidence in the practice environment. Or what we access might be so difficult to understand it might not make any sense to us. So that can be a frustrating barrier for many nurses and we know that sometimes frustrations with technology can add to that barrier. There may be a lack of support in the context. Perhaps there isn't much of an expectation to apply new evidence to practice in, this cur in a current practice setting. One of the uh, most powerful knowledge translation interventions that I recall as a young nurse was a manager that I worked with who was very famous for asking the question, hmm, that's a really great question. I wonder what the evidence has to say about that. So the expectation was set very clearly that questions were encouraged, but going to the evidence to answer those questions was also an expectation. We also live in a world of so much information. Sometimes it can be like information overload. When I started my career, it was actually possible to get your arms around all of the evidence that had been published on a particular topic. That's not even remotely possible anymore. So sometimes we feel like we're drowning in information. And workload is certainly a reason that nurses uh, state in research that they just don't have um, the ability or the time or the spaces in practice because they have so much overwhelming workload. And sometimes accessing new evidence can be framed like it's more work on top of what else is done. It isn't. It must be an important part of our work as professionals and there needs to be time in the practice environment in order to be able to do that important work of accessing and understanding and reading new evidence. Researchers can be part of the problem too. Remember we talked about um, the relationship between research users and research producers. Well, there's an old model of research called the ivory tower model where 
perhaps there hasn't been the best understanding of the needs of research users by researchers, or perhaps not taking an active role in working with end users of the research in order to really understand what their needs are and how that research might make sense in practice. So researchers have some work to do here too. More and more of them are realizing that getting research into practice is about relationships between research producers and research users. So it's not straightforward, is it? Or necessarily easy, but really important. So as a profession, we need to strategize about how we empower, equip, and expect nurses to work with evidence in practice. Again, you might be asking yourself, so what does all this mean to me? I need to survive this course. Well, this course will not prepare you to be a researcher or someone who designs and carries out a research study in order to create new knowledge. Hopefully, you'll go on to grad school for that pro part of the process. But right now, in this course, you will be equipped and expected to be a critical user of research. So, you will have opportunities to reflect on your clinical practice with a researcher's curiosity. You will learn how to ask good clinical questions so that you can find research to answer them. You will develop skill in finding those research articles to answer your questions. And you will learn how to read research and develop a good understanding of the basics of a research study. You will develop skill in assessing the quality of a research article so you'll learn how to critique and appraise research. You will learn how to synthesize findings from research studies and come up with the implications for practice. And you will learn a dissemination strategy. Remember, that's just a fancy word for sharing research findings. You'll be sharing research findings in a presentation to your classmates, as well as with the larger university community in the form of a poster. So let's go back to that really long and complicated definition. I'm not going to read it to you, but I do think you've learned some important pieces in this video about what this definition is trying to tell us. Essentially, knowledge translation is a dynamic process that unfolds within relationships between people, people who create knowledge and people who use it. It's about getting sound knowledge mobilized getting wheels underneath it in order that it gets used appropriately and ethically. It's about meeting the knowledge needs of people who are concerned, first and foremost, about making things better in healthcare. And that's all of us. I hope you've found this a useful introduction to knowledge translation. Please feel free to ask questions of your instructor if anything wasn't clear in this presentation, and your textbook is also a useful resource. I wish you a tremendously successful term, and I look forward to getting to know all of you much better. Have a great day.